Find a cool and unique jewelry piece for you or a loved one with Alexander D. Jewelry. Here you can find one-of-a-kind jewelry designs for men and women, designed by Alexander DeMay himself. Each design, including rings, earrings, necklaces, and mesmerizing moissanite, is meticulously crafted with precision here in the U.S. Speaking of moissanite, it's a sparkling gemstone that rivals diamonds in brilliance and durability without breaking the bank. Moissanite is the perfect stone to show your love and appreciation for your partner or get yourself out of the doghouse. Alexander is known for his commitment to using high-quality materials, ensuring that every piece not only looks stunning but also lasts for years on end. As a solo U.S.-based business owner, Alexander DeMay brings a personal touch to every creation, making sure each piece is authentic and unique and ships every design himself from the U.S. Dive into the inspiring and diverse collection for both men and women on his website, where you can find the most pieces are priced from $30 to $100. In addition, if there's something you'd like to see but don't see on his website, you could write Alexander an email or call him on the phone number listed on the website and he could design a unique piece for you. Visit his website using the link in the description of this episode and help support a small U.S. business. This is WWE superstar Drew McIntyre and you're listening to the WWE Podcast. One that everybody wants me. Becky Lynch is going to WrestleMania. Play more. Play more. Austin 316 says I just whipped your ass. This is my idol. You're going to acknowledge me. Well, it's Sunday night. That's time for your Week in Review here on the WWE Podcast. As we are one week away from Survivor Series, this week is a busy week here on the show as we have preview and prediction show we have a of course nxt review and AEW and everything else raw mailbag a full week a full plate is coming your way pun intended for those of us who are celebrating thanksgiving in the united states this thursday a full plate is coming your way i didn't even prepare that i didn't plan that or come up with it before the show just off the top of my head so uh all right thank you everybody for listening here on the wwe podcast we have A lot of great uh, listeners here on the show. A lot of them are going to be coming our way towards WrestleMania season, new ones. And I invite you to tell a friend or to join us on the ad-free side of things on Patreon. If you haven't already done so, patreon.com slash WWE podcast. A lot of options there on the base level, the NXT Plus, which gets you the After Dark show every other week. SmackDown gets you the After Dark show every week. And then as we go up in tier, you get more stuff. So check it out. I really encourage you to do so as we have a lot to offer, I think. And head on over to the website. We still have that thing. That still exists. Do people still use websites or is it all just on their phone? It's apps. (laughs) But we have one. If you are so inclined to drive yourself back to the year 2005, we have a website called WWEpodcast.com. And it's an ad-free experience as well. All right. Thank you, everybody. Again, let's jump in to this week as... The first thing on my mind, it's Cody Rhodes and Becky Lynch as a combo here. They come in a two for one, you know, as you might imagine. My first question is, and I don't know why I'm bothering asking this anymore because I don't get answers. Why? Why are they on the show? Why are they as Raw stars on SmackDown? Now, we know the real reason. The real reason is Roman's not there. We need to fill a gap. Star power seems to be down. Let's bring in stars from Raw. That's the real reason. But they'll never give that to you on the air. But that's the actual truth serum reason. We want more star power. We want to be able to have the draft but not have the draft. That's what it is. And now I was really hoping when Triple H took over that things would really change in terms of respecting the draft and caring about the draft rules. I really was. And I know you guys hear about me complain about this on a weekly basis, but it continues to happen regularly. And this week was especially egregious. And I I say to you, for what purpose? Why does Cody need to be the savior? Why does he need to be the white knight in shining armor every time a babyface is in peril? Why does he need to be that guy? 
why does Becky Lynch need to join herself, align herself with her mortal enemy to fight a group that she has no beef with? Why? Why are we doing this? This is just, it makes no sense. If I remember correctly, Becky Lynch had nothing to do with damage control as damage control was happily staying on SmackDown and on raw. She was working with uh, Zia Lee who kicked her in the head. Am I wrong? I don't think Becky Lynch had any interaction with the, 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 uh, I was gonna say judgment day, but with, um, damage control, there's so many heel factions. I can't keep it straight. Why? And I, I go, I'm not trying to start out as a negative. I'm genuinely asking the questions. That needs to be asked. And I know a lot of you guys out there are going, who cares? It's fun to see them on the show. And you know, hey, if that's how you feel, that's how you feel. And you are you aren't bothered by these things. And that's fine. You just enjoy the show and you don't care if they disrespect the brand rules. And to you, I'd say, you know, congrats. Good. You live a calmer, more solitary life as a wrestling fan than I do. This stuff gets me so heated. It it just it does because I want to believe in the draft, which is such a big deal every year. They tell us that these rules are concrete, and they find ways around them on a weekly basis. I remember they even violated the draft rules before they even became official this year. They couldn't even help themselves for one week before people are showing up, and to that I'd say, why even bother if you want? to be able to have two two uh, rosters but not have to have them confined to one and, and then don't. But don't tell me they are and then have them not. It makes no sense. Or if they do come to the opposing show, security should run them out of the building. Run them out of the building. And we've seen that occasionally. We've seen that occasionally happen where security decides to, you know, uh, you know, abide by the, the draft rules and realize, hey, this person shouldn't be here and they get kicked out. But that's more the exception than the rule. And, uh, and you know, it, it's just it, and, you know, not, on top of that, again, beyond the fact that the draft rules are being violated, which is number one priority a for me, which is just egregious and it's insulting to our intelligence and also why the announcers aren't even asking the question why are they here why where's security what where are those questions but no they don't because they're baby faces and we're all supposed to go like oh well they're 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 baby faces they're they're fan favorites so we're not going to question it but again that's that's issue one Issue two is, even if the brand rules didn't exist, why does Cody need to stick his nose in everything? Why does Cody Rhodes need to be that guy that comes out to save a babyface in peril every time? He's just kind of floating around and being this moral compass, this this moral overlord that we're all supposed to look up to as always doing the right thing, always giving people a second and third chance. What? No, no, I'm not going to take any advice from Cody Rhodes. I'm not going to take advice from a guy that still bleaches his hair in 2023. I'm sorry. I, I'm just not. Um, and look, Cody Rhodes, the man, from what I understand, genuinely great guy from what I understand. And I, I, I do believe there is, you know, uh, a really good person underneath this character, but that's all. I, I genuinely believe that. And I still believe he's a really good wrestler in the ring. I do. And he probably will be the one to beat Roman. And I continue to stand by. I'm okay with that as long as Roman is not champion anymore. But this idea that, that to Cody Rhodes is this ultimate savior now, which is which is what he's become. He, he can't even stick to his own show. WWE has to now anoint him as the savior of, uh, of SmackDown is uh, preposterous. Now, I do wonder, 
if Cody Rhodes and Randy Orton are going to cross paths, if this is what the setup's for. And also, no one's even talking about backstage when Nick Aldis, I forget who he was, who he was interacting with, they panned over quickly, and in his, in his office was Cody Rhodes. In his office was Cody Rhodes on the phone. So Nick Aldis knew Cody Rhodes was there, but then Nick Aldis told Cody, you have to go. Uh, you know, hey, I, I, I get he has to go. I don't, you know what? I don't mind if a talent wants to come to the show to talk to a GM. If they're going to actually implement a trade, fine. Maybe that's what this is. But it clearly wasn't something Cody should have done because Nick Aldis kicked him out. After he already did what he did, and he just kind of gently said, you got to go. <laughs> I mean, and, and then you have Becky Lynch, who came through the crowd. Why did Becky Lynch come through the crowd? Well, why didn't she have an entrance? You know, if these people aren't supposed to be here, by the way, how did Cody Rhodes get an entrance and have his music hit just right? Again, I know I'm tearing down the fourth wall here. I know that I'm digging too deep and just, oh, just enjoy the show. I'm not one of those podcasters, okay? I'm not sitting here just just, just play by play, giving you what happened, but not throwing in my opinion. No, that, that, in fact, that's exactly what this podcast is, is me criticizing when necessary and praising when necessary, and I do it at my discretion. So I just want to let you guys know that's not what this show is if you're a new listener. If you've been with me for a while, you know what this is. And I give credit where it's due. But the inconsistency here for Triple H and his regime here is concerning. Why did Becky Lynch come through the crowd? Why didn't she get an entrance? She got a big pop. That was weird. But then she stands side by side with Charlotte as the fourth member to take on damage control in war games. And I have no issue with the star power but you can't sacrifice star power for logic. That may be something that they don't care about. And they just, you know, star power is the ultimate goal. Logic can go out the window. Charlotte said, you know, when she wanted to call uh, or when she was being told to call Becky, well, there's a fine line between love and hate. And it's like, yeah. And I had a feeling she was talking about Becky and they're just bringing in star power. Apparently they don't feel they have enough which is nonsense. I know they took out Mia Yim. Okay. They also took out uh, Zelina Vega. But WWE acted as if they are the only options. Of which, by the way, uh, they didn't beat them down in a way that they would say, oh, they're not going to be available in a week. You know, so, okay, they took a beating tonight. So we can still choose them. You know, um, but I get it. However, you still have B fab. Okay. You have Alba fire Isla Dawn. I understand they haven't really been present that much. And B fab is smitten with, uh, Bobby Lashley. I understand that. Okay. You know, the, the, it's, they WWE acted like they didn't have an option and they did Scarlet, I guess is still available too. Although that doesn't really make a ton of sense. So, they essentially took out all the options, but did they really? So they had to go to Raw? I mean, how did that get negotiated? Sorry, guys. I know I'm spending a lot of time in the open on this, but you, you when you knew that you saw that and you, you've listened to this show before, you kind of had an idea of where I was going to go to open the show. I know a lot of people don't spend a lot of time on this, but WWE needs to get scalded as if they care about what I say. When it's... When it's you know, necessary when it's warranted. This is warranted unless there's some big overarching plan of which I have zero faith in. Then I'd understand it. But Becky Lynch, again, this is where I'll end it and then I'll move on. I promise Becky Lynch aligning herself with someone that she verbally has denounced in real life many times. There's true. And I don't know, maybe it's been put out. Maybe the hatchets have been buried but in the years past, they have not got along. They've had actual issues, even though they have worked well together. So why all of a sudden has Becky Lynch decided, hey, screw whatever I'm doing on Raw. Let's, t- let's you know, put that aside. And I'm going to align myself with somebody I 
truly dislike to fight a group I never had an issue with in the first place. That makes sense. And by the way, instead of giving someone an opportunity to showcase themselves in war games, which by the way has zero consequence, there's nothing on the line ever, why not put somebody younger in there? Why not put a Mia Yim? Why not put uh, you know Zelina Vega? Why are we just why are we putting star power above all else? And I'll I'll stop there. So think about that, guys. <laughs> maybe there's something I'm not thinking about, and maybe somebody can uh, argue against it. Of oh, who cares? You're thinking too much. It's all it's just fun. It's isn't it isn't it a better match? Then I'd say no, it's not because now it makes less sense. To me, star power isn't everything. So, uh, all right. Well, I'm going to move on to other things that happen on SmackDown. Of course, you guys can check out the SmackDown review that was done by Michael Ritter uh, on the feed that I put up earlier today. So, all right. We did get the open of SmackDown again with the uh, betrayal of Asuka on Charlotte, which, yeah, hey. Or the betrayal, was it Oscar? No, it was the betrayal of Oscar on Bianca, which in effect by proxy was also Charlotte. And uh, the Road Dog is on commentary. That was kind of cool. I don't mind Road Dog, uh, Brian James on commentary. I think he did fine. And Bailey said they were here to have a good time. She, of course, she had to welcome everyone to SmackDown. I'm not even going to get into that anymore. I just don't know how anyone's not annoyed by that anymore. Like, am I the only one sitting here? totally turned off by everyone always being obligated to, to welcome you to whatever show they're on. That's not the wrestler's job, by the way. That's the announcer's job. Just jump into your storyline. Don't play host. You're not the host. Just effing let's go. Totally takes me out of the moment. <laughs> Sorry. I'm on, a, I'm on a bit of a rage tonight, guys. All right. So Bailey said she's... No, normally she's humble, but this was brilliant. She called them the most dominant faction in WWE. Yeah. I'd, uh, I think I have a faction or two that would disagree. And they said they're playing chess while everyone else is playing Candyland. And Bailey laughed at her bad jokes, and the rest of the faction was quiet. Asuka cracked the joke in Japanese, and they laughed. Dakota said that this isn't new, the new and improved damage control because someone in the ring wasn't a part of the new damage control yet. And Bailey lo- looked surprised for a minute, almost as if they were going to turn on her or something. But uh, Dakota said that Asuka hadn't been officially inducted, and Bailey did that. And uh, they announced the War Games match. And then Bailey again acted surprised, but played it off like this was a great idea. And then Shotzi's music hit. And that ridiculous Power Wheels tank comes out. And no one was in it, as no one should be, because it's a toy and it's embarrassing. But Shotzi drove on it. Uh uh, Shotzi drove on the damage control members from the top turnbuckle. I'm sorry, she didn't drive the tank. So I'll take that. Charlotte and Bianca joined, and the, the whole brawl happened, and then everyone was outnumbered. The baby faces were outnumbered, and uh, damage control stood strong. Okay, LA Knight and Jimmy Uso was then advertised for later. We'll talk about that soon. We got then in a match here, uh, Elton Prince and Kit Wilson, Pretty Deadly versus Ridge Holland. And then Montez Ford and Angela Dawkins. This was interesting. Uh, you know, triple threat here for the right to face the undisputed tag team champions. A nice match. It ended with the Street Profits beating the Brawling Brutes and pretty deadly in 11 minutes. Backstage, you could see Bobby Lashley looking on with B Fab at one point, kind of again, as I said earlier, smitten with him or just talking business. We're not sure yet. Ridge, this is the finish if you wanted to play along here. Ridge sent Ford to the outside. He and Wilson battled on the top rope. Prince snuck a blind tag in, and Ford landed his frog splash on Ridge Holland. Prince tried to steal the win and with an Alabama jam, and Butch broke it up. The Prophets landed a double dropkick on Pretty Deadly and cleared everyone but Ridge to ringside after a misfire from the kick to Butch. They landed the revelation and got the win, so the Street Prophets continue their winning ways and they are going to face the Judgment Days, Damian Priest and Finn Balor next week for the Undisputed Tag Team Championship. So heel heel kind of tells you this match is going to be relatively short, you would think. Although you can get a good match out of these men, but usually heel heel matches don't last long because crowds 
as a general rule of thumb, are disinterested in two guys and two teams that they don't like. So we'll see how that plays out. I wouldn't expect a title change, though. That's pretty much a guarantee. So after that, the Bob, Bobby Lashley walked out. He celebrated with them, and we saw the attack on Mia Yim backstage. So fine. Yeah, wh- whatever. <laughs> I mean, I don't mean that disrespectfully, but the Street Profits continue their winning ways, and it's nice to see the Street Profits getting a, getting victories, but it feels like they have been having their, uh, their, their growth stunted in terms of character development over the last several weeks. Like, they, they align themselves with Bobby. They're, I guess, in the heel role. And they're winning, but they didn't do anything cheap to win. They won outright. So I, I generally thought this was still a lot of fun to watch. I mean, 11 minutes of, of a, you know, three three really good teams is still fun. I just would like a little bit more. The continuation, the evolution of the Street Profits, who and what are they? That's what I need to know. And right now, I know they're aligned with Bobby. I know that they're willing to do things that they weren't willing to do before to win matches. And uh, it's a good start. But it feels like they've been stagnant a bit over the last couple weeks. Then we got Dragon Lee versus Axiom. This arguably may have been the match of the night. And I think I've said this before with Dragon Lee. He had a really good match several weeks ago. And... uh, Dragon Lee and Axiom, who was from NXT, and if you never saw him before, it was an introduction that I think you'll at least know the name if you watch the full show here. And Nick Aldis called him up from NXT so he could show the world what Lucha Lucha Libre can do. This is a lot of fun. So many near falls where I thought it would be a pretty quick match for Dragon Lee. Maybe Axiom was there as a somewhat enhancement talent for Dragon Lee. No, this was a lot of back and forth, a match that land, uh, lasted just under 10 minutes. So relatively long match considering all con- things considered here with both names not really being that well known, especially Axiom. If you've never watched NXT, then you have never heard the name before. So this is a lot of fun. And Dragon Lee did win, as he should have, but the finish was having... um. Let's see. Uh, Lee gets set up for a power bomb. Axiom reversed into a Canadian destroyer. Lee landed a kick, went up top. Axiom landed the Inseguri and met Lee on the top rope again and landed a Spanish fly for a close near fall. And then Axiom went for a Hurricane Rana and Lee reversed it into a, ty- a, a Liger bomb for a close near fall. He then followed up with a knee strike and Operation Dragon for the victory. So... Uh, kind of a very respectful win. No hanky panky. No uh, shady business here, as as expected. And Dragon Lee goes over Axiom. A lot of fun. This is a great introduction, and one that I hope they continue. And it doesn't also need to be also. Uh, by the way, like a uh, uh, you know a um, lucha libre match where it's always masked wrestlers versus masked wrestlers. Because I think it'll it'll reach a ceiling, right? Like you want them to be able to expand beyond just themselves, their bubble. It's fun if you see it for a while, you know, uh, but I think they're going to have to expand beyond themselves, even though they work very well together with their styles of wrestling. Um, And I don't mind it for another several weeks with Axiom and Dragon Lee, maybe having another match and then eventually teaming up. But I... Ultimately, I think that uh, this was a great introduction for Axiom. It continues to showcase Dragon Lee and what he can do. And uh, th- this was just a fun match that I think could have even gone longer. All right. We continue to get a little more promotion for LA Knight and Jimmy Uso for later in the show. And uh, I think that uh, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. But uh, let's take a break. I want to take a break for the sponsor of today's episode. And then you guys know we'll be right back on the other side to finish up SmackDown, talk a little bit about Raw, and a lot of other stuff. So stay right here. Find a cool and unique jewelry piece for you or a loved one with Alexander D. Jewelry. Here you can find one-of-a-kind jewelry designs for men and women designed by Alexander DeMay himself. Each design, including rings, earrings, necklaces, and mesmerizing moissanite, is meticulously crafted with precision here in the U.S. Speaking of moissanite, 
It's a sparkling gemstone that rivals diamonds in brilliance and durability without breaking the bank. Moissanite is the perfect stone to show your love and appreciation for your partner or get yourself out of the doghouse. Alexander is known for his commitment to using high-quality materials, ensuring that every piece not only looks stunning but also lasts for years on end. As a solo U.S.-based business owner, Alexander DeMay brings a personal touch to every creation, making sure each piece is authentic and unique and ships every design himself from the U.S. Dive into the inspiring and diverse collection for both men and women on his website, where you can find the most pieces are priced from $30 to $100. In addition, if there's something you'd like to see but don't see on his website, you could write Alexander an email or call him on the phone number listed on the website, and he could design a unique piece for you. Visit his website using the link in the description of this episode and help support a small U.S. business. All right, let's continue on here with our... Smackdown uh, chat, and this is where we got Santos Escobar coming out, and he got his Legato del Fantasma music. This was good. I, I was hoping they would kind of move back to that character that we never s- really saw get off the ground, because that looked like it could have been a lot of fun, and then LWO took over, and he was morphed into this kind of soft supporter of Ray and became kind of invisible. And now he's back to the forefront in a big way, big way. This was a, for, for Santos Escobar in WWE, this was a career defining promo. This was that good. Was it legendary? No, but for his career, tell me you don't feel more for and know more about Santos Escobar in five minutes of his promo than you did for five months of him in the LWO. It's amazing what a promo can do. And he knocked it out of the park. I mean, he hit a home run here. There was a lot of, by the way, the crowd in Evansville, which I was very surprised they mentioned the town Evansville. So credit to WWE there. I got to give them credit because usually when they're in Evansville and there's not an NFL team there and they feel like they're above the town they're in because it's too honky tonk. They don't mention it or they'll name just, oh, we're in, uh, we're in Indiana, you know, undisclosed location or in the shadow of, you know, that kind of thing. But they mentioned Evansville. So that was proud of WWE for that. But a lot of boos and you suck chants broke out for as Santos and the Evansville did a nice job. They were genuinely a good crowd all night. And, uh, so a lot of heat, unexpectedly intense heat for Santos, but that's a good thing. So Santos talked about the expression of never meet your heroes. He said he came from a long Lucha Libre tradition and all of his family members were considered heroes, but this was Ray, Ray Mysterio. He always dreamed that the next generation would see him the way that he, he viewed Ray Mysterio. And he said that Ray became a father figure to him and made him feel at home. But after uh, last week, he realized that everything Dominic Mysterio said about him was true. That got a lot of heat. And he recalled recalled Ray winning the U.S. title when he deserved it. uh, And then he took over the LWO and added new members. And Santos blamed Ray for siding with Carlito over him and said the only thing he would apologize for is not doing more damage. And this is where it got good. He said he wished he got an infection in his leg. He hopes the surgery was botched and his leg has to be amputated and he never gets to come back. That's awesome. How many times do you actually hear the wrestlers speak about the surgery or surgeries that the, uh, the, the, the wrestler actually getting it done? You hear, you hear them speak negatively of it and specifically dark. Like that was great. Good stuff. Zelina Vega came out and said, what the hell was he doing? She made the decision to choose Ray over him. She slapped him and then she walked away. I actually thought there was a chance that Santos might attack Selena and then get mega heat on himself. I, I thought there was a chance, but no, uh, she has the, uh, don't forget the invisible uh, shield around her of being a woman, but um, Cruz del Toro and Joaquin Wilde walked down to the ring and they were confused and frustrated with Santos. And he said that they responded uh, rather. Um, he said that uh, they, Santos responded that they were dead weight and they should get out. He then attacked them from behind, which was great. 
Carlito came down, made the save, and Santos escaped through the timekeeper's area. This was uh, this was great. Attacking from behind, attacking Ray personally, hoping his surgery gets botched and he gets an infection. The delivery was on point. His demeanor felt like he belonged. Is just all of it. I was the only thing, and this is just me being, you know, kind of a, the impossible to please fan. Is if he had uh, instead of attacked them from behind, kicked them right in the nuts, you know, both of them, cowardly, that would have been even better. But I'll take the attack from behind. It's not a complaint. It's just me being, you know, a, a jerk. But this was awesome. This was a lot. I mean, I enjoyed this way more than I thought I would. And it showed us Santos can talk. If you forgot that he can, you now know he can. And he was brilliant. And Rey Mysterio, though, is truly, it went under, underwent knee surgery. So he is actually going to be out for a couple months. So it's going to be some time before we see Rey. So th- this is a program in the making. And I'm. I'm all here for it. Okay. Grayson Waller and Cameron Grimes. Quick match. Grayson Waller beat Cameron Grimes in about two and a half minutes. And uh, that that's pretty much it. So after the match, Bianca Belair was shown speaking to Zelina Vega backstage. And then Damage Control was shown beating up Zelina Vega. And then Paul Heyman was in the ring. This was an interesting promo. Paul Heyman got deep on this. Deep to the point of like, Almost like he was reading fans' minds. So, after the recap of what Solo did to John Cena was shown, we had Paul Heyman standing in the ring with Solo, and he called it an acknowledgement ceremony and gave Solo his props for beating Cena after a series of Samoan spikes. And Heyman teased John Cena being present for the show, but he obviously wasn't. He then said Cena doesn't have the guts to come back and talk to C Nation because it's all of it's all because of Solo. Heyman then did a countdown and said it's that's how we know it's serious because that was John Cena's cue. This is the part where he comes down to the ring and bumps them out of the ring with five moves of doom and the crowd goes crazy. Heyman then mocks Cena and said he couldn't go back to WWE or Hollywood or uh, and no one would ever again get to experience John Cena. He said he was about to congratulate Solo again. Uh, but then L.A. Knight interrupted. So before we get to L.A. Knight, this was a really good promo by Heyman because it was a lot of us thinking, wow, Cena might be here. He'll come out now. Like, and, and Heyman was acknowledging when Cena would normally come out and hitting the five moves of doom, which is what you were expecting to see, some of us. And like he was kind of going around on and on. He said, you know, and if John Cena is stupid enough to come back and he will be like, he kept talking about how he knows John will eventually come back and and all that. And like, it's, it it was like, he was just kind of getting into the minds of fans projecting forward what we're all thinking. So that was nice to see and, and, and different also. Now, the one thing I will say is that the Samoan spike thing is, I have no problem with Simone Spike, but again, we were told that John Cena with one Simone Spike wouldn't be able to talk and that his whole career would be over from a wrestling and a Hollywood standpoint because he can't communicate. Yet at the event, at the uh, Crown Jewel event, he was hit with what, 20 Simone Spikes? And John Cena, by the way, didn't, now he didn't talk afterwards. But he didn't also sell it at all. Like, he didn't sell. I mean, why didn't anyone grab their throat? And, you know, I have an issue with LA Knight on this, too, and I'll get that in a minute. This is a shot to your throat from a blunt object. Why is no one selling their throat? They're just selling it like they got knocked down from a clothesline. No, this is a very specific part of the body. Sell it. Cough. Choke. Act like you're dying. Instead, they just get knocked down like it's any other move. It's not as effective, especially with John Cena getting hit with 20 of them. He didn't sell his throat once. He just walked away like he had just, you know, been rolled up. Sell the throat if it's that bad. Put a blood capsule in your mouth. That would have been way more effective. 
and having the fans question if he's ever going to come back. Instead, he just walks up the ramp, leaves, and same with LA Knight. We'll get to that in a minute. Okay. All right, let's uh, continue here. So, LA Knight and John Cena, or uh, John Cena, LA Knight and Jimmy Uso. So, this was a match in which LA Knight had to win, and he did in nine minutes. And after the match, Solo walked down to the ring, and he and Jimmy jumped LA Knight. They were about to put him through the announce table when Cody Rhodes, of course, had his music hit, and he ran down to the ring, and he cleared the bloodline from ringside. And backstage, Charlotte met up with Shotzi and Bianca, and, and uh, he said he, she called her person, right? Okay, but LA Knight, again, I think he got Simone spiked. Did he get Simone spiked in, at the end of this? I think he did. Or, uh, yeah, so he did. it, And I, I have an issue with that, too. LA Knight didn't sell it either. He didn't sell it like he had got, you know, shot in the throat. He just sold it like he got punched and knocked down. That's the issue I have. LA Knight did the same thing, and I like LA Knight. And LA Knight had some fun insults, as he always does, uh, you know, for Solo and for uh, for Jimmy. And he was good on the mic. Uh, I mean, LA Knight had a good night on the mic, as he always seems to have, is just good. And that that that's fine. Again, but I, I would argue that great needs to be commonplace if you want LA Knight to be elevated to that, to that next level. And as I've said, this is a massive test now. For fans, we're now in the true test from WWE, where we went through the fun, organic, ooh, LA Knight's getting steam, let's jump on the bandwagon, he is kind of cool, and then we push him all the way, he's like, oh my god, when he gets a title match against Roman, he'll be the guy, he gets a title match against Roman, albeit way too soon, which tipped the scales massively in the favor of Roman, he didn't win, now you're thinking as a fan, oh, WWE can tell us, oh, we gave you your match, now go about your business and cheer for the people we really want you to cheer for. And now the test is going to be, can the fans sustain the support for LA Knight? Even better, can they continue to grow that support? That's the test, because now we've seen LA Knight get to the mountaintop and fall off. Now what do we do? Do we get off the bandwagon? And if we do, WWE is going to say, huh, see, that's why we don't do knee-jerk reactions. So this is going to be a true test of fan loyalty to LA Knight. What do we do when he loses the big one? That's the key. So, but of course, Cody Rhodes at the end of this comes out, as I mentioned, he's Mr. Savior and wooey. All right. So the Charlotte uh, introduction here of Becky Lynch was fine. And uh, again, it makes no sense. Also the, at the very end of the match, when everyone is just grouped together, stuck together like glue so Charlotte can drop on everybody. Charlotte dropped on about two or three people and there was about 10 people at ringside and like all 10 of them dropped. Even Becky Lynch was like, well, everyone went down. I have to throw myself to the floor. You see that though. This is not a knock on the women. This is a knock on any time you have those spots where someone doing a moonsault or, uh, you know, an over the top dive of sorts lands on like two people. And apparently it's supposed to be this, uh, you know, bowling pin type of scenario where everyone just falls even if you didn't get touched, you just have to fall. And it looks ridiculous. Go back and watch. Those spots are so just, it just takes me a moment, man. Uh, but they wanted Charlotte to be taken out of everybody, and she took out everybody, and great. We have Miss Miss uh, Becky Lynch. The, the positive is that you are going to put Becky Lynch in a program that is more exciting than anything she's done in the last six months or more. So there is that even if it is just for one night. Because Becky Lynch has also been kind of a rut herself, albeit with Zia Lee helping build new talent is kind of a, a, a downer too, if they're going to move away from helping Zaya get the rub from Becky. We'll see on Raw. So that was uh, SmackDown. Now, uh, if you want to remind yourself of what happened on Raw, I can do a very quick rundown as I do every week here on the Week in Review. And the matches anyway where we got Seth Rollins and Sami Zayn versus Dominic Mysterio and J.D. McDonough. The World Heavyweight Champion Seth Rollins and Sami defeat Dominic and J.D. in by DQ, though, in 10 minutes. And this uh, next match was Shinsuke Nakamura versus Otis. And this ended with Shinsuke Nakamura beating 
Otis in nine minutes after about three Kinshasas. And then we got Tegan Knox versus Piper Niven with Tegan Knox beating Piper Niven in just under five minutes. We got Miz and Gunther uh, interacting backstage. Tommaso Ciampa versus Ludwig Kaiser. And Ludwig Kaiser beats Tommaso Ciampa in exactly 10 minutes. We got Zia Lee versus Indy Hartwell. Zia Lee beats Indy Hartwell in two and a half minutes after ref stoppage from the kick to the head, which I'm really liking here. That's where Becky Lynch came out here, as I said. And she set up the, uh, she tried to hit the manhandle slam on Zia Lee, but Zia Lee slipped away. And um, they said that they're going to have a match next week on Raw. So, there, well, there you go. I answered my own question. Zia Lee and Becky Lynch are going to have their match tomorrow night on Raw or tonight, probably as you're listening to this, which would then lend itself to probably damage control coming in invading Raw, costing Becky Lynch her match and Zia Lee the victory. So that's probably my guess here. All right. The next match, Miz versus Ivar. Miz beats Ivar in about 10 minutes. Then we got a lot of Gunther talking backstage. We got Finn Balor and Damian Priest versus Cody Rhodes and Jimmy Us- Cody Rhodes and Jey Uso for the undisputed tag titles. This match was 22 minutes, an eternity for a Raw event, a Raw match, or any really non-PLE match. And this ended with the Judgment Day retaining because Drew McIntyre cost them the match by giving Jay Uso the Claymore on the outside of the ring. And then you see Drew walk back up and shake hands with Rhea Ripley. So did Drew officially join? Was it a one night Alliance? Was it just payback for all the hell that McIntyre was put through by Jay? We will see. It'll be interesting to see what those developments are on Monday night, but appears it appears we did see the official turn of Drew. I wouldn't put it for sure, but I'd say it's about 90%. So McIntyre is likely the new, uh, one of the new top heels on Monday Night Raw. And it's going to be fun to see Drew, what he can do as a heel, I have to say, because Drew as a heel is long overdue and one that uh, has a lot of avenues and a lot of new opponents he can work with instead of being a baby face. So that'll do it here. Again, full week coming for you guys. Full week. Great time to join us on NXT, on the uh, the uh, Patreon side of things on the NXT level. If you want to just get in the door, it's a dollar a month for the Discord server, for everything ad-free. You can bump yourself up even just a couple bucks a month to the NXT Plus and get an additional show every other week and a lot more above that too. So you can join us also on WWPodcast.com or Apple Podcasts. We have a ad-free button right in the native app, Apple Podcast app. And it's going to be a lot of fun this week. Don't forget, enjoy this week because guess what? The next PLE Royal Rumble isn't for two months. Okay. We got eight weeks after this. So enjoy this PLE because it is going to be a long time before I say it's a PLE week again. It'll be next year before I say that. So, all right, everybody, thank you so much for joining me here on the WWE Podcast. Please give us a five-star rating if you can. And I will talk to you guys next time. Find a cool and unique jewelry piece for you or a loved one with Alexander D. Jewelry. Here you can find one-of-a-kind jewelry designs for men and women designed by Alexander DeMay himself. Each design, including rings, earrings, necklaces, and mesmerizing moissanite, is meticulously crafted with precision here in the U.S. Speaking of moissanite, it's a sparkling gemstone that rivals diamonds in brilliance and durability without breaking the bank. Moissanite is the perfect stone to show your love and appreciation for your partner or get yourself out of the doghouse. Alexander is known for his commitment to using high quality materials, ensuring that every piece not only looks stunning, but also lasts for years on end. As a solo U.S. based business owner, Alexander DeMay brings a personal touch to every creation, making sure each piece is authentic and unique and ships every design himself from the U.S., Dive into the inspiring and diverse collection for both men and women on his website, where you can find the most pieces are priced from $30 to $100. In addition, if there's something you'd like to see but don't see on his website, you could write Alexander an email or call him on the phone number listed on the website, and he could design a unique piece for you. 
Visit his website using the link in the description of this episode and help support a small U.S. business. Thanks for listening to the WWE Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss a show or head to wwepodcast.com. And for all of these shows ad-free, head over to patreon.com slash WWE Podcast. Until then, we'll see you next time.